All right, I'm um, going to go and get started. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, let me know. So, um, now my plan is um, probably to talk about the the assignment four as usual, um, but we can also talk in general about um, recursion um, a bit here. So. Um, but yeah, and then in general, to see if, if anybody shows up and has any specific questions about things. So, um, So let me go ahead and as usual, um, kind of a show going over the steps, uh, getting the um, assignment four set up. So uh, let's go ahead and haven't, haven't accepted the assignment yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and do those. We'll go to our GitHub um, invitation link, accept the assignment. And we should have our uh, assignment for repository. Um, and let's get our dev box running here. Um, oh, um, I think I forgot to share my screen, didn't I? Um, okay, yeah, thanks. I uh, just noticed that. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, I got the dev box going. Um, all right, let's get into it here. Oh, I still got the stuff from the last assignment up here. We'll close off this one first. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, we're ready to clone our repository. That. All right, so then let's configure the project um, and confirm everything's building and running. Confirm that our um, um, code formatter and style checker are running um, and being reformatted on save, all those kind of steps here as usual. So.
I'll get to the command line first. Do make clean, make. And make tests should all run. Um, should be able to use the keyboard shortcuts, control shift one, control shift two. And control shift three to build and run the tests. Um, and um, I guess just as a quick check, now we should see that um, it will be reformatting indentation stuff if I mess up and do a save. So, so yeah, it looks like the formatter um, class style checker is working and everything is building. So you should always make certain you're, you're at that point uh, before you um, begin working on the assignment here. So this week we're uh, um, talking about recursion. Um, so for the assignment, um, you have to uh, create, actually you end up just creating two recursive functions, um, but we first create um, a non-recursive version of those. So using basically a loop or, or iteration. Um, um, for our first two tasks here. Um, um, oh, actually, yeah, we're going to actually create uh, three recursive functions uh, and then, but, but first create uh, non recursive versions of all of these. So, six tasks total, um, um, where we do two versions of each task or, or each function. Uh, one uh, where we don't use recursion, and then one where we do use recursion. So, um, oh yeah. So this week, um, another kind of point about this: we're not um, working with classes this week, so we're back to using just regular Python or sorry, regular um, uh, C plus plus functions here instead of a, a class where we're adding member functions. Right. Um, so just to remind you about that, so that means that um, um, oh, uh, but but I should talk a little bit. So um, uh, we are using um, a, a class. So all your functions are going to be using this list class. So uh, let me describe that a bit here. So it's talked about in the assignment description. So there actually is some test running when you um, do this assignment. Unlike, I can't remember if this is the first time where you actually had some tests commented out and running. So um, when you do the, the, the make test or the control shift three, um, you'll see that it's running one test case and, and, and um, um, 64 assertions are running here. So, um, you are, we are actually given um, a, a class called a list class this week, uh, but you're not going to actually be making changes to this list class. You're going to be using this list class. So um, for, for the assignment for, so, so it's good to, to understand um, what it does and how to use it, right? So as usual, if you um, need to use something and you've only got the source code, a good place to start would be the header file. So the header file for the list class uh, will give you basically the member functions and, and basically the, um, the public API. Right, so so from the, the public member functions that are defined in the header file, this will tell you what you can do with the list class. Okay. Um, so the um, uh, the list class just allows us to create a basic list of items, um, and uh, in this case, uh, it only holds a list of integers. So, uh, uh, in, in the week before, uh, 
you had to create a set. So you were actually creating uh, the implementation for a set class. Uh, and for that set class, we also just restricted it to a set of integer values. So here, um, we're going to have a generic list of values. Okay, so the difference between a list and a set is going to be that um, uh, the list, you know, we could have multiple of the same value, right? So uh, a list is not a set that, you know, each value isn't unique. Um, So the kinds of things you can do with a list besides constructing it um, is find out what its current size is. Um, and um, you can actually access this. So this is the first time we've had some examples of operator overloading. Um, so we've got some overloaded operators and, and let me show you how these work. So these basically allow you to use op these operations on instances of the list class. So you can use the square brackets to do indexing operations. So basically, you, um, um, we'll see an example of this, uh, and let me walk you through it. Um, but you'll be able to use the list class in your own code uh, as if it was a regular array. So you'll be able to index into the, the list. So index 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, also, there's a, a a double equals, so this is for doing comparison. So you'll be able to compare whether two lists are equal using this equal operator. Right. So, um, uh, oops. so looking at um, examples of using a list class um, might make that clearer than just trying to describe it. Okay, so if, if you look through the first test case. But you don't have to do anything in this this test case here, but but this gives you some examples of how you can use these this list class. So you'll have to be able to use the list class in these same ways for the code that you're writing for recursion here for assignment four. So if you create an instance of a list, um, I mean you know you can use the regular member functions like um, get size um, and the string member function returns a representation. So initially, um, if you create a list, it'll be empty. So its size will be zero, um, as we expect when we call get size here on our list. Um, and if you get a represent, if you get a string representation using the string member function, um, you know you'll get a string that looks like this, where it tells you what the current size of the list is, and if there's any values in the list, you'll get the values. Um, in your string return back here. Okay. Um, another example, so we can use, um, instead of the default constructor, we can use a constructor that takes an array of, of integer values. So in this case, we've got uh, five integer values. So if we construct list two, L2 like that, um, its size is five. So here's our first example of using the overloaded operator. So because we define this operator here on our list class, um, and don't worry too much about these overloaded operators, um, um, next week or the week after next, we're going to get into more detail about, about you actually um, implementing overloaded operators like this. Okay. But um, sorry, but this basically um, allows you um, for the overloaded square brackets operator to use it to index the list um, as if this was an array. Okay, so, so like we had this array of integers, because we defined the overloaded indexing operator um, on our list type, you can also index the list type um, to to read the values out of the list, okay? So, so this should work as we expect here. So the, the value at index zero should be a one. And if we get the value out of index zero from our L2 list, um, should, we should see that it's a one, right? And the value at index one should be a three and then negative two and then so on. And then our last value um, is at index four. 
So this this list of has five values in it when we construct it like this. So, so the valid indexes are going to be from zero to four. Um, and that last value is a set. Um, yeah, and, and if we get out the, um, the string representation of the list, um, we see what the size is and, and what these values are. And our index is zero through four here on our list. Um, and uh, having this indexing operator uh, defined correctly allows you to not only read values out, but to, to actually assign values in. So you can also use um, the indexing operator to change the values of the list. So if we want to, we can uh, change the value at index zero from a one to a five by assigning into it. And, and after you assign into it, um, if you read the value back out, um, it should have the value that we just assigned into it. Right. But the main main reason why we give you this list class to use for this assignment form um, is we want to implement some safety. Um, so try to keep make it so it's hard, if not impossible, to, for example, access values beyond the end of your arrays. Okay. So last week you had to do some things with managing memory on your own. Um, so a common problem whenever you're allocating arrays of memory and then trying to access those arrays of memory is, is accessing values um, beyond the beyond the bounds of your array, okay? So again, for this uh, list two here, uh, if it has five values in it, that should mean that the valid indexes uh, are actually from zero to four. So if you tried to read or write a value beyond index four, like index five or higher, or if you tried to, to read a negative index, so, so something below zero, so like negative one, um, ideally um, instead of you know, so if you did that for uh, like an array, um, C++ wouldn't stop you from doing that, or, or C wouldn't stop you from doing that. So if you create an array of five values, but you access the array at index five, which is one beyond the legal uh, last index of the array, um, it wouldn't necessarily stop you from doing that. Um, and you would, you would be actually clobbering memory uh, if you tried to write values, or you'd be reading values um, that weren't part of the array, right? But for our list item, for the indexing operator, we actually check the bounds. So if you're curious, you can look at the code that does that. So if you look in the implementation um, for list.cpp, and you look at the, um, the overloaded operator, um, indexing operator, I call that. It's basically the operator for the square uh, brackets here. Um, it first checks if you try to um, index, um, a, um, uh, if you try to give it an index that's below zero or greater than or equal to the, the current size of the list. So if you do that, it throws an exception instead of doing a memory access um, that's beyond the bounds of the array, which can cause memory corruption um, or other problems. Right? But if it is, is a valid index, it just uses the, um, um, it accesses that value from the array of integers that we're using. So, so like you had to do for your set or for your large integer, this list class just uses an array of allocated integers to, to hold the list of values that we're that we're managing here. All right. Um, some other things that you'll have to use for this list. Um, you can actually copy, so you can you actually can't do this with regular arrays in C, right? So if you created an array of, um, 
of um, integer values, like values two here. And then you wanted to create like another array of integers um, and wanted to assign the values from values two into a new array. So, so you can't do that because by default, um, you can't assign one array to another, right? So, so a fu the, the fundamental array type doesn't allow you to do um, uh, assignment and, and copy all the values from one array to another. Um, but um, uh, but uh, we have um, what's known as a copy constructor, which you should have read about. We didn't use this uh, last week when we did our work and in, in our materials on classes in C++. Uh, but there's a type of copy, there's a type of constructor for a class called a copy constructor that we'll run across some more that is being used in this list class here. So in particular, that's um, this constructor here, right? So if you give it a reference to another list, uh, it'll call the copy constructor um, and again, you can look at the code that does this here. So what this does is um, um, the copy constructor, if you get given another list reference, um, it creates, it constructs this list to be a copy of the other list. So, so it sets the size of the new list that we're creating to be the other list size um, that we're copying. And it dynamically allocates an array of integers of that same size, and then it copies all the values from the other list into this list to copy it over. Right? Um, so the upshot is you can do things like this, right? So if I create a new list L3, but I assign it when I'm constructing L3 to be the values in L2, the copy constructor will actually be invoked in C++. Um, so all those five values, the current values in L2 will get copied over to L3, right? So at that point, L3, L3 and L2 uh, are exact duplicates of each other. So L3 should have all the same values um, that L2 had. Uh, but it is a copy. So if I start modifying L2 or L3, so like if I change some values in L3, only those values in L3 would be changed. Um, so, so after I modify index 0, 2, and 4, L3 has been modified, but L2 was not modified because it is a true copy. So L2 still has the original um, 5, um, 10, and negative 7 at those indexes, right? Uh, and vice versa. So if I modify L2, it doesn't modify L3. Um, and then finally, because we've got the the uh, the equals operator um, defined, um, we can check whether two lists are equal or not. So after modifying L2 and L3, uh, L2, um, I mean, L2 should be equal to itself and L3 should be equal to itself, but L2 is not equal to L3. So it's false that L2 is equal to L3. Uh, they, they no longer, um, they're, they're separate lists and they no longer have exactly the same values. But if I make a new list L5 that's a copy of L3, it should be that it's equal to L, L3 and L5 should be um, equal until I modify one of the two lists, for example, at which point they're no longer equal. So. All right, so, um, Any questions about that? So, you know, you'll need to uh, understand because for the functions that you're to be creating for the assignment four, you should be um, doing all the operations um, on these on lists instead of just regular arrays. Okay. So, like the, the very first assignment in this class, 
we did things with where we passed in regular arrays to the function to work on those. So, so now in this assignment, we're going to be going back to writing regular C functions, but we're going to be passing in um, lists, actually references to lists um, as a um, input here, right? So, So as usual, let, let me go ahead and uh, give you the um, the signature for the first function here. So the first function is we want to write a function to, to sum up the values in a list, okay? So both sum recursive and sum iterative are going to take a list as input and return um, the, the sum of the values in the list, all right? Um, but the iterative version, should you should do that implement it by writing a loop, but the recursive version, you should do that by using recursion. All right. So, um, so if you want to get more information about what the signature looks like for your sum iterative, we can uncomment first uh, test case and again when we save that file it should reformat your um, your indentation and stuff correctly if you've got all your um, visual studio code um, uh, files uh, the, the style checker set up and, and everything working and your project configured correctly um, so the, the signature for the, the lists, um, for, for the sum iterative and the sum recursive, uh, looks like it, it takes three parameters here. So um, I should describe these. So um, we take a list as input. So here we're passing in this L0, which is a list. And since we didn't, since it's using the default constructor, the list is empty. So that it has no values in it, right? Um, and it takes two other parameters. So it takes a, a list, it takes uh, indexes. So here, um, this is the begin and in index of the values that we want to sum up um, in the list here. All right. So um, it might make more more sense if I jump a little bit to, to, to this example here. So for uh, the, the the list two, the list two here, we we construct it so it has ten values, right? So, and, and again, since we have 10 values, the valid indexes are zero to nine. So if I say sum up the values in list two from index zero to nine, so, so that's what these, these indexes mean. Um, that, that means sum up all the values and, and these are inclusive. So start at and include the, the value at index zero in the sum and go up to and include the value at index nine, the last one. Uh, my, my my third parameter here, right? So the sum of these presumably of, of all 10 values is 35 if you sum those up by hand, right? So we got some positive and negatives. Uh, but then this should make sense. So I, I can sum up sub lists uh, of, a, of a bigger list here. So, you know, if I just sum up from zero to zero, I'm just summing up one value. So that should be three. And if I sum up the values from zero to zero, zero to three, so that's zero, one, two, three, that's the first four values. So that's eight, uh, 15, that's 20, um, sorry, uh, eight, 15, 20, 24, right? And with that in mind, that should, should make um, some of these, the, the, the previous two examples hopefully make a little bit more sense. So if I have a list with only one item, I can sum up that one item by saying sum up the values from index zero to index zero. So I, I would get five for, for a list with, with the single value five in it at index zero here. You can actually also ask to sum up um, let, you know zero values. So if I give from zero to negative one, uh, you should end up 
returning zero in that case. So, so if you ask to sum up, that, that's asking to sum up an empty list, right? So if the second index is less than the first index, um, the result should be zero. Um, if you sum it up uh, like that. So, um, All right, so let, let's let's do the signature. So I, I, I'm sure I describe it here, but um, uh, so you need to, to pass in a list and then two integers um, for here. That list should be passed in as a constant reference parameter. Um, and I, I see that I might have in, so, so we're not, you shouldn't be modifying that list. You should be summing up the values. So if I didn't describe it here, um, um, I should have, described it as being not only just a reference parameter, but a constant reference parameter. So we should be passing in, that in as a constant reference parameter there. I probably fixed the description there for the assignment. Oh, it's going to be too late for everybody that's already cloned the assignment there. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, all, all of your work is uh, for this assignment is actually going to be, be done in the librecursion.hpp header file. So you won't be making any modifications to list.hpp or, or list.cpp. You'll, you'll, all your functions will go into librecursion uh, header file and that .cpp implementation file. Um, So in this case, um, our fit, our signature looks something like this. So we're taking a, a a list as input, a constant reference to a list as input, and two integer indexes, the begin and end range. Um, for the um, um, uh, of the values that we want to sum up of, of the sub list uh, for this list to sum up here, all right? Um, so you should have, you know, your um, function prototypes as usual in the header file, and then you should have the actual implementations of these functions go over into the implementation file. Um, yes, yeah, so another curveball I'm throwing you on this assignment is I didn't provide the function documentation. So up the, the previous three assignments, um, I had written function documentation for you, uh, but I want you to start writing the function documentation um, yourself. So we, we can stub this function out um, to, to return zero here, but um, um, before I, I, I test that it compiles and runs, uh, let's let's add function documentation here. So so all functions, whether member functions um, or um, um, or just regular functions like this. So, so this isn't a, a member function of a class. It's just a regular uh, C plus function, C function, right? But you should always have function documentation. Um, so function documentation, we're using doc oxygen uh, format, um, and, and maybe I'll show what that means here uh, real quickly as the last thing uh, today. Um, but you should always start with uh, slide, with two stars to represent this as doc oxygen documentation. And you should always have like a brief description. So use the brief keyword. If you need to, you can look at like a previous assignment or you can look at, um, uh, for example, the, um, um, documentation um, that I have in uh, in here. Uh, so it's, I guess that it's, you don't have to use the brief keyword. Um, I didn't have that always here, but um, uh, but you can explicitly use like a brief keyword. So you should have a, a brief description. Um, And then you should have a longer description. Um, so this should be at least a sentence or, or more. Uh,
So this function actually uh, sums up the indicated sub uh, portion of the lists, all right? So the uh, begin and in range parameters uh, specify uh, the uh, sub list uh, to sum up and uh, return the sum results. And, and then um, you should, so for function documentation like this, you should always document all parameters. Uh, so each individual parameter will have a param doc oxygen tag, um, and then you should give the name and the parameter after the at param. So in this case, the name is list, and then begin range and end range. Um, so this is a constant reference to the list instance uh, that we are to sum up, and then, you know, so you should always keep your lines to about 80, 80 characters or most. So if you continue lines, indent them by like a few spaces um, consistently. So the list is a constant reference to the list instance that we are to sum up sub portion of and return a summed result. And then we also have the um, beginning index of the uh, sub portion of the list we are summing up. And then the in index. And then there's finally one more thing. Um, um, if it's a value returning function, so it's a void function, you don't have to, to document the um, um, not certain why the IntelliSense didn't get that tag there, but um, um, the tag should be returns, it does. Um, and um, and so if it's a value returning function, you should say what type it's returning, um, and then you know give a description of the return type. So it returns the, the value, returns the sum, uh, the indicated sub list of our, of our input list. So, all right. So um, this is a, a good habit to get into. So this, this um, you know, whenever you're writing a function, you should always be clear. Of, I mean, you have to have a name for the function, but you should always be clear about the inputs that are coming in. So that's why you document the input parameters here. Um, and uh, the, the, the value that it's returning. So most functions are value returning functions. They take inputs, they, they transform those inputs in some way or, or work on those inputs and return a result, right? And then the description should be describing what the function does, not, 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 not how it does it. So uh, although I kind of leaked a little bit of how it does it here because how it, how it should be doing it um, is you should be using a loop to iterate over those values and sum them up, so, but um, uh, but but the, the description should be what it does, right? Um, so anyway, I hadn't tested yet, but we should test um, after um, uncommenting the test that it it builds now with my stub function. That's just returning zero. Um, and that it um, uh, runs a test and, and we'll see where we're failing now. So um, now it's getting down to line 186 before we're failing um, because we're expecting um, 
for a list of size one um, that it should sum up to a value of five uh, here, right? All right, um, so so uh, just a word that, so how do you implement that? Well, uh, again, you know, kind of go back, you, you need to use the operators for, for the list. So you've got a list, so you can use the same thing. So, I mean, basically as a hint, you've got the indexing operator. So um, even though it's, it's a, a it's a list class. You can use it like it's an array because it's got the uh, the the square brackets indexing operator. Okay, so with that in mind, you should be able to directly write a for loop that iterates over. Although um, in this case, so notice uh, back to the first assignment when we passed in an array, we passed in the array and we passed in the number of values in the array uh, in order to do operations on that array. Okay, so for the list, when we pass in the list, you can uh, use the, 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 the square brackets to, to access the values in the list, right? So how do you know what the size of the list is? Well, this is an object, um, so this is a class. So um, to find out what the range is of your iteration, uh, you know, so you have to iterate from zero up to um, the, the size of the list, you can use the get size, right? So instead of passing in the size of the list as a se separate second parameter, we've encapsulated that in our list class. So, so we have both the array of values and its size, right? So you're expected to use get size to determine um, for for the um, uh, the sum iterative to determine the range to iterate over, and then you're expected to use the indexing operator to actually access the values and sum them up um, when you're implementing uh, your sum your sum here to, to sum up the, the indicated range of values and return uh, the resulting range there right so that oh actually um, I, I misspeak so actually uh, the your loop um, you are kind of given the, so you really don't want to iterate over all the values. You have to iterate over the exact values that you're given as the beginning in indexes here. So, so yeah, so actually now that I think about it, you don't really need, need the get size in this case. Um, so, so you're told what the begin index is. Um, and now I think about that, maybe, well, and, and so what, what, what the be beginning value is uh, of, of the index you need to start at and what the ending value index is that you need to go up to to, to sum those up um, and, and return the sum of that. So. All right, um, questions about that? Um, so basically the, the sum iterative and the sum recursive have the same signature. So the sum recursive works exactly the same way. So, so you'll call it with exactly the same um, signature, right? It, the name is just different, right? Um, so I, I don't think I'm giving away too much to then show that one. Right. And again, don't forget to um, include function documentation. So once you got one, it can be a little bit of a time saver to use that. Although if you do copy and paste, make certain that you do read it over um, and um, modify appropriately so that um, Um, but yeah, besides that, so, so these functions are, are identical, but um, in this case, though, 
how you implement them um, is part of the assignment, right? So it'll be incorrect if you implement the sum recursive using iteration. And it'll be incorrect if you use recursion for some iterative, okay? So you need to use a loop or, or you know, just explicit iteration for the sum iterative, and you have to use recursion um, for the sum recursive, okay? So our uh, materials this week are about recursion. So, so the basic way to do this function recursively is that the, the base case is going to be if the begin range is equal to the end range. In that case, so for example, if begin and end range are both zero, uh, you don't have to sum up anything. You just have to access the value at that at that index where they're both, you know, when they're both equal, and just return that. So that would be your your base case for recursion. And if they're not equal, um, um, or, or um, uh, I might have described that differently. So I think I gave a description here. Um, um, uh, oh yeah, so, so I gave a, a different base case and this is a better base case to use. So this will also uh, do the case where you uh, sum up a list of, of that, uh, that doesn't have any values in it. So uh, the, 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 a good base case to use is if the end is less than the beginning, then in that case, you're being asked to sum up an empty list. So in that case, you just return zero, okay? So if you detect that the end index is less than the beginning, uh, return zero. Otherwise, um, you, you, can, you can take the value at the first, at the beginning index and add that to the, to the, result of calling some recursive on that plus one to the end, right? Does that make sense? So, so, um, um, so like if I ask to sum up the values for the list from zero to four, um, I can add up the value at index zero plus the, the calling myself recursively on the values from index one to four or, or whatever, one to three here, right? So that's what we're talking about uh, here. Um, so any quick questions about the first two tasks here, first two functions? And then I'll talk more about these on Thursday. Um, once people get a, a chance to, oh, did, I, did I freeze here? There we go. Um, I thought maybe some more details about these uh, next time. So um, the, the next two functions are to actually um, reverse the list. Okay. So, um, and again, for, for, for these, um, uh, we're, we're actually going to be reversing um, a sub portion of the list. So we pass in both a list and a begin and in index. Right. So, um, So if you look at the uh, the, the test case, uh, the first one for the re reverse iterative and the reverse um, recursive, and then you'll see the signature. So so the signature um, is the same. It's it's a it's a void function, so it doesn't actually return a result. Uh, but you pass in a list and a begin and in index for both for reverse iterative and reverse recursive. Right, um, and the result is that um, uh, like this. So, so if I if I pass in a list one two three and I ask to reverse all the values from zero to index two, um, the result should be it reverses the values three two to, to, to become three two one. Right. So so we don't return an, an explicit result. Um, we, there's an implicit. Um, work being done here to to reverse the values in, in that sub portion of the list that we specify. All but yeah, you don't have to reverse the whole list. So, 
if I have a list of size 10 and I just reverse the values from zero to one, uh, it just reverses the first two values that index zero and one get reversed. Right? right. So that's reverse iterative. And again, reverse recursive has exactly the same tests and exactly the same results and function signature. Uh, but um, it, so for the first one, you're supposed to use iteration. Um, and for reverse recursive, though, you need to write the function as a, a recursive function. So recursive implementation. Um, And then the last two um, is a palindrome detector. So the, the, the palindrome detector works something like this. Um, so Basically, a palindrome is going to be a list of numbers that's the same forward and backwards. So in this case, you know, it goes one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. So, so if I was to reverse that list, uh, you still have exactly the same list, right? So, so in that case, if I ask if it's a palindrome, and, but again, we're giving it a, a range of values. So if I ask if it's a palindrome for the whole list from index zero to eight, the result should be true um, for this one. And the way that you're going to implement this, as is described in the assignment, is to reuse the um, 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 reverse function, right? So basically, you'll create a new list, a copy of the list that you're given, um, and you'll reverse that list, um, and, then, and then you'll check if the, the lists are equal or not. All right, and I'll go into more detail on that uh, next time, but I'll, I'll leave that at that. One more quick thing I wanted to show. Um, so, so back to this function documentation that I'm asking you to begin writing now. So I had two examples of function documentation for the uh, sum iterative and the sum recursive. Um, you can actually generate the doc oxygen um, project documentation. Um, it, it's, it, we don't have a keyboard shortcut, so you have to go to a terminal um, to do this from your assignment. Uh, but the, uh, the, the make um, assign, uh, sorry, the make reference docs will generate the, the doc access and reference documentation. Um, so what you'll see when you do that is um, uh, it'll create two new subdirectories, a, a LaTeX subdirectory and an HTML subdirectory, uh, but in particular, so for example, if, if you go to your um, host system, let's say I'll go to my file browser um, and I'll look inside of my um, my dev box repository directory under the assignment, assignment four, um, you should see that it generated the HTML. And for example, if you look in there, there'll be one file, uh, which is the uh, the index, the starting index of all the documentation that was generated called um, index.html. So you can double click on that if you want to. Um, but you should find, for example, if we go to the list of the files, we could say browse to um, the recursion that HPP and we'll see that um, it's basically pulling out the documentation from those um, those at the, those those doc oxygen strings so like the um, um, the at brief and the at pram and the at returns and things so we should see the documentation for some iterative um, has the parameters pulled out um, the documentation from the at returns tag. Um, and then this is the brief description. And then the, the fuller description gets pulled out uh, here. 
same for the, the sum recursive. So, all right. But this kind of doc oxy oxygen, um, so you can generate um, reference documentation for a project is a, is a common uh, standard thing for, for most uh, code projects nowadays. So it's, it's good to kind of understand what those things are and, and begin learning how to use um, project documentation, um, um, so doc strings and things like that um, um, in, in a project here. All right, so yeah, I think that's that's it for today. Anybody have any uh, uh, quick questions here that are uh, with me here before we sign off? Um, if not, I think um, I think I had a good capture of the video. So as usual, I'll post this for people that are watching this asynchronously. Um, and, um, you know, I've been having lots of good questions on, on emails and by, um, GitHub. So, you know, as usual, feel free to shoot me emails or post your questions on, on GitHub. Um, I try and check those at least starting by Wednesday or Thursday and, uh, the, the work people are doing on GitHub. So always get started early, push your commits as you do them to GitHub. So I can, I can see work in progress as you're doing things. Um, and yeah, that's it. So I'll end this video and I'll see you guys later then.